This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, episode 075. Welcome to the show created by vets featuring absolutely no pets. This is the Veterinary Project Podcast, hosted by Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Our resident veterinarians have swapped out their stethoscopes in favor of microphones to bring you the Veterinary Project Podcast, a show focused on real conversations aimed to connect this amazing profession full of remarkable people. Through the sharing of collective stories and wisdom and connecting over the many unique challenges we face, we invite you to join our community of veterinary professionals leading intentional lives. And now, here are the hosts of the Veterinary Project Podcast, Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Jonathan is in an exceptionally feisty mood today. He's fresh off holidays, fresh off his 41st birthday, got away with the family skiing in Fernie. I know that's like your favorite place to go. How are you doing, my man? Look at that. He throws the 41st out within 10 seconds before the recording. He's like, is it all right if I say it? I was like, yeah, no problem. It's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Well, in fairness, I mean, before I hit record, you told me I'm a, I'm a young pup still, still on the nipples. <laughs> For anybody that wants to know, this gentleman is still only 36 years old. All right. He is just getting his way out of the dead. That is true. And I had some other comments, which I will leave off this podcast. <laughs> That's probably for the Yes. Future. So going back to your original, Fernie, our favorite place, without a doubt. We had a lot of fun. Uh, joined there with another good uh, friend of ours, of which uh, Dr. Stephanie, she's been on our podcast. So we went together as a family, had a lot of fun. Everybody was out skiing, had some great snow. It was exactly what we want. Yeah. Really happy. Quick, uh, quick question. Were you able to stay unplugged, like off the work emails and phones, or how did you manage that? Because you got a lot on the go. You know what? Teams are everything in terms of uh, having everybody set up. The first two days, I was on it more than I should have been. The next five days, clear sailing. Literally was on it probably 10 days or 10 minutes a day, which was great. So that's kudos to the teams that are in place in my different businesses. So I give kudos to them fully. So yeah, we were able to unplug and spend the time we needed to that's amazing too many people take uh vacation if you're watching i just did air quotes and then don't unplug you know and they're still on their emails on their phones four or five hours a day anyway so it's like well you didn't you just you just worked from a new location yeah completely and i look at it as going hey you know what we're we're you know a little ways into january of 2022 and i think that's one of the best reasons why uh we're having success already in a increased way is that we are focused on ensuring people get away mm -hmm. we cannot have that continual burnout we're talking about in veterinary medicine what does it look like our end of year conversations around overtime etc get people home so that they can enjoy it. get people away from work and what do we need to do as organizations to help that along yeah it's been pretty awesome so enough about me what's been happening your way nice yeah well i mean i'm keeping keeping busy uh off to a good start i literally just before we jumped on here uh, signed the papers on a refinance on one of our apartment buildings. So that was yeah. a big win. Um, refinances so, are a lot of paperwork. So th this was like a six, maybe nine month process to, to finally cross the finish line. So I'm excited. For those of us that don't know what that means, what is a refinance on a commercial property? And what does that look like? Okay, the, the 30 second version of that is we bought an apartment building that needed a bunch of renovations. We went in and did all those renovations, got tenants in place, and that increases the value of the building. So then you can go to the bank and say, hey, can you please evaluate this building? What is it now worth? And it's typically worth quite a bit more than it was because you, you did all those renovations. And then the bank will say, okay, because this building is now worth so much more, We'll reevaluate your loan on it, or you can switch banks altogether and take out a new mortgage on that property, which allows you to pull a bunch of your original capital out. Right. Do you have to sign a document at the start, like when you go to originally buy it that says you can do this, or is it? Oh, no, because it's already my apartment building. Yeah. Right. So I'm not, not selling it to anyone. Mm -hmm. Right. We're just entering in, like closing our existing mortgage and entering into a new one. So that's what I mean. In commercial properties, 
is there an innate or is there is there a is there a function of the mortgage that allows you to do that well it's just coming up to the end of its term the old okay. mortgage so this is where you need to be strategic and line those things up like when is the value of the building going to be be like peaking when are you done renovations to refinance so that's kind of the world I live in. And then we won't, this is not this episode, but that cycling of money, that velocity of money is so powerful. And we need to get into that because there's some interested people that want to know what the heck Mike does okay. on his day to day. I know it's fun. Okay. Anyway. So yeah, that's a huge win for me. I think Rosalie and I will probably celebrate that a little bit uh, tonight and then um, on with the episode. So today you know, we've been talking about you have all these teams in place that allowed you to, you know, take some vacation. I have an apartment win that just happened. Those are all kind of goals and end results. Today, we're going to talk about how do you get to your goals? What are the actions that need to be taken? And then specifically, what are the habits that you need to build? Um, so I guess we can call this episode almost a book review of Atomic Habits by James Clear. For anyone who has not read that book, I highly, highly recommend it. It's unbelievable. So the concepts that Jonathan and I are going to talk about are James Clear's concepts in his book, and then we're going to add our flavor to them. Couldn't have said it better. We're going to take the spin and what we're learning and where we've struggled and then try to put it into our business life and the vet clinic scenarios that we know about. Okay, excellent. So I want to kick this off. There was two quotes when I went through this book again. And so we, Jonathan and I spent January like re-listening, re-reading the book and two quotes punched me kind of in the face um, on this one. So the first one is actually from Carl Jung, who is a psychologist. Until you make the unconscious conscious, it will direct your life and you will call it fate. And that one is just like, wow. So, so many people are operating on autopilot. They have all these habits that they are just not aware of. Can I jump in for a second? Absolutely. We all do that. We all do that as a, as a need to process the day-to-day -day life. And yet we actually don't recognize 95% of those. You can't even call them innate. They just happen. But Carl talks about it as habits, which is yeah, a then, different way of looking at it. Yeah. And if you're unaware of it, you'll just be like, well, it was fate. And it's like, well, no, it was all of your habits compounding over years and years led you there. You just weren't aware of it. And so the second quote kind of builds off of this. this. This, I believe, comes from James Clear in his book. He says, we don't choose our earliest habits. We imitate them. And so I am getting firsthand experience with this right now with Riley, who's a little over two years old. She's not choosing her habits. She's doing whatever mom and dad do. So embarrassing to admit, I chew my fingernails for whatever reason. My dad chewed his. I started chewing mine. Riley's starting to chew hers. And I'm like, no, this is not what we want. She's just imitating me, right? And we do this in every area of our life, like how we earn money, probably what our health is, you know, what we think of ourselves, our self-talk. Um, so I kind of wanted to throw those two quotes out there to kind of set the tone of what we're what we're looking at with these habits. Such strong quotes. And I hope people uh, can now think of their own uh, connections or analogies when it comes to those quotes, because they are powerful. I think there's another quote towards the start of the book also that you uh, speak on. And I think we need to talk about a little bit is small marginal aggregation of changes, habits over time can lead to massive results. And you and I have seen this in our own lives, but I think James Clear puts it very clearly. Tell us what that looks like, Mike. Well, the, yeah, and this is, this is really the whole, this is the it's core tough. of the book. This is why he called it Atomic Habits, Atomic being very small. And I think the, the punchline of his book is Tiny Changes, Remarkable Results. There is there there was a, a, a picture or a meme that was that I saw online years and years ago, long before I knew of this book. And it's a math equation and it shows 1.01 to the power of 365 equals 37 point something. And the point there is if you can just get 1% better every day and you do that 365 days in a year, 
at the end of the year, you will be 37 times ahead. It's huge. That's mind blowing. When you like the human brain cannot comprehend compounding, right? There's all sorts you of examples. Really bad on that. job. Really bad job. Well, the math is too hard to like do. Right. When you think of that, like doing a one something one percent better, like taking the stairs versus riding the elevator, you, you're just like, well, that did nothing for me. OK, but you do that over and over and over and over and over. And it's like it does result in crazy changes. And especially when you're doing this across your life. So yeah. I think like his quote right at the end of the book, he says, habits don't add up. They compound. Right. So. Kicking into that, the other thing he talks about in there, and this is very applicable to veterinarians, when we talk about mastery, you know, mastery of something, mastery of a pr profession, it requires dedicated practice, right? You have to review the game tape. You have to review your results. I always think of the saying, you know, practice makes perfect. And I've never liked that saying, because if you're practicing the wrong thing, you're just getting better at doing it wrong. So let's bring that into the context of veterinary clinics. We talked about this in our pre-recording. What are some examples that we can both relate to? Well, for me, the one that jumped out, I, I think of surgery, yeah. right? If you tie your ligatures wrong, you know, maybe they're not landing square or whatever. And everyone who, anyone who's done any amount of surgery knows how much on autopilot you become. Like, I, frick, I, it feels like I would do cat spays and then you'd be like, I just did a cat spay? Like, oh, okay, yeah, no, it's done. So I must have done, did it, right? Like it just becomes so autopilot. And if something in there is being done wrong by you, you don't know and you're just getting better at doing it wrong. So it's really important to, to sort of take that ego out of the equation, look back, you know, if you're having higher rates of surgical infection, like wound dehiscence, you got to go look and say, hey, what, what's going wrong here? Yeah. Anything for you that jumps out on, on that? Yep. Operationally, I think about it from a clinic perspective and communication, uh, especially around an area of a lot of experience in related to parasiticide control. So parasiticide control is one that is, uh, depending on the clinic, depending on the situation, sometimes sloughed off and or that place that's always put to the end of a communication when you're in a wellness exam. And if you are not conscious of having that either um, shared in a process, maybe by an RVT or somebody else, or the doctor doesn't implement a process that is actually within their, their um, normal framework of communication in a wellness exam, we don't tend to move parasiticides the way we should be to the well-being of that animal. And so over time, it compounds. You've got animals that should be either on six months, 12 months in these areas where we don't have heartworm, i.e. Alberta. Uh, and all of a sudden, you have animals that are once or twice a year at best don't have the proper parasiticide control that they should be on. And that's not the animal's fault. That's not the owner saying no, it's because we haven't done the right things over time. We've practiced imperfectly from a communication standpoint to the importance of this individual. And that is spread across the board with many different places in vet med. So man, that's a great point. I'm just thinking through the, the like wellness exam spiels you get on. Right. And sometimes it's just like, you're, you're just going, you're checking all the things. This you're makes me thinking. This makes me think of another like concept and book, which I won't go on this tangent, but like the checklist manifesto, like pilots, airline pilots, everything is a checklist. It has to be double verified because the because the consequences are massive, right? If there's a failure in the air, um, that's interesting for a vet clinic, right? Like some sort of checklist, so these things aren't missed. Oh, I've seen some vet clinics that do that and do that very very well, where they have. Um, sheets that are color coded and they have to check off even if you have multi-decade rbts they're still required to check off the six steps to an anesthesia pre-surgery so that you don't as an example miss the pop-off valve actually being shut off when it needs to be open etc and there's so many little mistakes that we make in veterinary medicine um, that could be removed by some of exactly that checklist habit yep okay Excellent. Well, yeah, I mean, that kind of sets the framework of like the meat and potatoes of what this book is about. We're going to dive through kind of his four steps of a habit. And then he has laws around all of them. And I know you and I have different, you know, different thoughts where these have applied to our life or things we want to implement. So the four steps to a habit are the cue, 
the craving, the response, and the reward. So when you think about something that happens in your life, you typically, as a habit, you will move through those steps. And then James talks about laws that he has around each one. So let's dive into the cue. If you want to build a good habit, you make it obvious. And if you want to decrease a bad habit, you make it invisible. Any thoughts on that, Jonathan? Yeah, there's a couple ones in these that jump out to me. Um, and this is actually from a first law, which is this one making it obvious. Uh, it's an important one for me. This one, if I have the right cue, I'm more likely to follow through with a new habit setup. The first is uh, using habit stacking. Habit stacking states that after a current habit, I will add in X new habit. Easiest one to think about in general life, and he uses in this his book, is after the current habit of brushing your teeth, I will add the new habit, if I want it to be a new habit, if I don't do it already, of flossing. For me in my life, as uh, I've got older, you mentioned that earlier in the episode, <laughs> kids, responsibilities. Do you still I have teeth? Love, I thought maybe I it was like, teeth. take your dentures maybe. out and just plunk them in the cup for the night. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not that old yet, but I'll get there one day. They're still looking white. Uh, I used to go to the gym in the evening. Used to be really comfortable going to the gym anytime between 5.30 and 7.30, 5.30 to 8.00, doing hockey, squash, whatever else. Life is not allowing me to do that anymore because of my responsibilities. My habit stacking has now led to in the morning, immediately after I get up, I go to the gym. So my habit stacking is that in the individual context, whether I'm at home or at a hotel for work, I wake up. My current habit, I do it every day. I get up, I go chug my bottle of water, and I go to the gym. That was really difficult. My wife's been doing it for years. I looked at her and went, you're crazy. How are you waking up at 5.30 and 6 o'clock and doing a workout? And then I started doing it a couple of times. I was like, this is brutal. So I stopped doing it. Then I went, wait a second. That actually made me feel better. And all the other habits that compounded over that day. So then I put in some other pieces we're going to talk about but I have it stacked. It's an, it's an additional attentional move that I make every day. Nice. Nice. That's my, that's mine making it obvious. And then we talk about design your environment. So design your environment is another piece of the first law. My design of the environment fits along with these lines of the gym. We have a gym in the house. So this goes so that we have designed our house to move around our healthy habits. We've taken one of the rooms when we did our renovations and turned it into a gym. That was designing our environment to the habit that we wanted to make so that our cues of good habits were obvious and visible. And we also want that for our kids. So they see us in action as opposed to, hey, mom and dad are at home, which we aren't a lot for work, et cetera, but they see us working out. They see us being healthy, yeah. important yeah. for us. And that's it. They'll, they'll imitate that. That will become their first habit. Yeah. So for, for me on this uh, step one cue, a few things jump out, uh, making it obvious, really easy one for me is uh, like fruit and vegetables are, and he says this in the book, we've been doing it for a long time is just the apples, big bowl right on the counter, but then to make it invisible beer. I mean, I like, a, mm. I like beer, take, get it out of your main fridge. We have a fridge in the garage. You know, it's so it's not visible. If I want to have a beer, I have to be like, oh, it's out in the garage. I've got to go get it right. It's not obvious. So every time I open the fridge, I'm not being cued by it. Um, I would even go so far. I was thinking about this. Lots of those glass mini fridges, yeah. right? Because you can see through oh, it. It's just, it's just sitting there being like, come on, come drink me. And it's like, I think about this as people like design their, their house and build their basements. And it's like, what do you want? Do you want alcohol to constantly be like looking at you saying hey come drink me because now you got to make a decision oh. right and veterinary another veterinary. decision and you only have a certain amount of willpower during the day so eventually it wins eventually and i mean that's all know about decision fatigue so you got to eliminate those in the veterinary clinic specific example i really chuckle at this one you've been in more vet clinics than me i have yet to be in a vet clinic where there is not a table or a counter of junk food. Like it's like, so right. I remember going, the last clinic I worked at, there was this long counter and I'd come out of the office and like to get to the treatment room, 
It's like checking out of a grocery store where you got to, you got to run the gauntlet where there's chocolate bars on one side and candies on the other. And you go through it like frick 200 times a day. How can you not reach over and pick up chocolate? I'm smiling right now because Bridgeline Vet Clinic right now is that way. And my wife gave me shit yesterday because I ate two chocolate bars. She's like, you didn't need to eat those chocolate bars. I'm like, no, but they tasted good. She's like, did you even taste them? No, because I I had done exactly that. We had walked back and forth and I went back down to the office, came back up. I'm like, yeah, I'm going to eat a chocolate bar. That's how it happens, man. Oh, good, so, Mike. So that'd good. be my vet clinic example. Okay, so moving good. so moving on, step number two in, in the habit sort of loop, after the cue comes the craving. So if we're trying to encourage a good habit, you want to make it attractive. And if you're trying to decrease a bad habit, you will make it unattractive. Any thoughts on that one, Jonathan? I think this is a really important one. Uh, and in that second law of making it attractive, one of the main points, it's one of the three main points that James Clear speaks about, talks about joining a culture where your desired behavior is the normal behavior. Mike, I think your discussion last year on running is the perfect example on this. So I'll put you on the spot on that one. Uh, tell us about that. Yeah, this, this landed for me. And so within this sort of craving uh, he, he tangents off and he talks about the different ways that you can form a habit and they can be like outcome-based process-based or identity-based with identity-based being the strongest and outcome-based being the weakest. So the running example that you had alluded to back in late 2020, when I was, you know, searching for something health-wise to keep me like motivated slash inspired. I found a, a guy on Instagram that was like reasonably fit, but he was running with his kids in a stroller. And I think it was like by the beach. And it was just all the imagery around it. I was like, that, that is what, who I want to be. I don't even know who the guy is or what his name is, but it's like, I want to be the dad and the husband that run, excuse me, runs with Riley by the river. So that was an identity habit that started driving my actions. And it has been powerful because when it's minus 20, I'll still go out and run because I'm driven by identity. So Larry, or jump, yeah, go ahead. Can I jump in for a second though? Because I think in the pre-recording, you had another point, which I thought was really, really valid is, and we talked about this a number of the times last year. What was your goal originally with running last year? So, and I'm still keeping this goal as a target is to run a 10K in under 40 minutes. Yes. And then you had ball hockey, you hurt yourself, so you couldn't continue on. But that being said, because you focused on your identity as opposed to the end goal, you're still with it. And in my view, you've been successful with building that habit, not because of your perceived failure of hitting the 40-minute threshold, but your building of the habit around the identity of being a runner. And that to me is a huge piece for this second law. Yeah. And so he says in there, you know, incentives start a habit, identity maintains a habit, right? And I think sort of a, a, a vet spin on this, it, it made me think of going in on days off, right? So I, I, I don't know how it was for everyone else, but for me, you know, the first time you go in, maybe you've got a patient overnight and you just pop in on your day off because you're in the neighborhood anyway, Right. Everyone's like, oh, what are you doing here? It's your day off. And the manager's like, oh, you came in. Very like well-received. You know, they're like, oh, good job. Great patient care. This is amazing. Maybe you're on production. Maybe you see a case. Maybe you take an appointment. That sometimes happens. You just, you just earned a little more pay. There's your incentive. You do that enough times and it becomes ingrained in your identity where all of a sudden you expect yourself to go in on your day off. Everyone else is expecting you to go in on your day off. Right. And so this would almost be, in my opinion, an example of identity taking your habit negatively, because I'm more of the belief your days off should be your days off. Yeah. Agreed. So, yeah. Nothing to add to that. And I also think that is a bad habit. Over and time. I, I just want to close but that. It on. follows the normal, but that one follows the normal that you set up in terms of the four steps, cue, craving, response, reward. All of them follow in that adage, but perhaps to the negative in veterinary medicine in that context. Yeah, it can. Um, on, on the identity piece, just zooming out back to the running example, 
where I think people can stumble, because you're right, if I had just set the goal, run 10 kilometers in 40 minutes, and I had no identity attached to it, it's like, who cares? Like, that means nothing. It's just numbers. And I see that in the, in the health space, you know, usually losing X number of pounds, losing weight. But it's like, that's, that's a pretty weak target if it's not attached to anything, right? It's just a number on the scale that really means nothing. Right. And then some people will take that a step further and they'll attach it to a process, which is I have to go to the gym X number of times. But again, if that's not tied to an identity, it's not going to stick. So agreed. Okay. Fully Excellent. Agreed. Okay. Moving on then third step. So we've got the cue, we've got the craving that moves us into the response. And if we want to make a habit successful, we're going to make it easy. And if we want to decrease a bad habit, we're going to make it difficult. Yeah. What are some thoughts there, Jonathan? Yeah, I think this is a great one as well. And this is a, a third law uh, in terms of some of the pieces that we've talked about make it uh, really relevant in both business as well as vet clinic setup in life. The first is in the third law, reduce friction. Decrease the number of steps between you and your good habits. Related to my gym in the morning, I put my gym clothes right beside my bed. They are literally sat there every day. So I don't even have to think about it, make a decision, anything. I just wake up and put my shorts on. That's, that is the first cue in my wake up before I go down. And that just reduces that friction. I also prime my environment, which is part of this uh, third law. And this is related to business. When I'm setting up my weeks and I've been getting better and better in this, I have my calendar laid out so that I have time and space to do some of those administrative functions I need to do before the meetings and the chaos of the day erupts. When I am set up in my calendar successfully that way, priming the environment, my day goes so much better because I can follow through, get the things I need to get done before having to tackle the things that come at me. And therefore I am being proactive instead of being reactive, making it as easy as possible for me. Lastly, to making it easy, I love this part. Mike and I have talked about this a lot, automating your habits, investing in technology, one-time purchases that lock in future behavior. There are a number of apps, task finders, to do us, other pieces that in both business and in veterinary medicine can help your life be better. And that, again, in all of the context is setting you up for that response step. Those are my examples. How about you, Mike? Nice. Well, I mean, with me, some of my examples, they almost blend in with, with, the, with his second law around the craving. But for me, it comes back to environment again. You know, that was a big learning for me in 2021 was molding your environment around what you're trying to create. Um, he, in the book, he talks about examples with monkeys and mimicking the behavior of other monkeys. And if you have like a superior nut cracking technique, but then they place you with another group of monkeys, how you'll adapt to them. And where that sent me thinking about was culture and veterinary medicine, right? This is a big one. This is, this is a big one you, you provide as an example. Yeah. And, you know, he, he talks about that. He, humans are social creatures, right? We want to be accepted. And, and he, he has all these experiments and examples in the book. But the punchline is we would rather be wrong with the group than right on our own. And I mean, obviously that's a broad stroke. There's exceptions to everything, but you will probably adapt to what the many are doing. If you, even if you're doing something differently, that is right. Right. So I think about this in the culture of veterinary medicine, where, you know, if the culture is wrong, if the many of the vet clinic are doing something, you know, inappropriate or unethical or whatever it is, everyone is going to adapt down to that. And it can go the opposite way. That's where strong leadership, consistency, time, habit formation in that clinic can lead to change, can lead to growth. That's where veterinary medicine can also change, adapt, learn from these concepts. Yeah. And I think, you know, tying it in to, to his third, like laws around it, make it easy or make it difficult on the positive side. If everyone in the vet clinic, you know, is, is behaving under like, you know, what the, the culture and, and executing like in the best interest of clients and pets, 
it's easy to do that. That's just what you do there, right? Like you don't, you don't stand out as like the weird person that is doing things morally. So agreed. I, I, no, I that's really, a whole talk. This is a whole, this is a whole podcast in its own. Well, I feel I'm, I'm almost sitting here being like, I almost was hoping we'd maybe push Jonathan off the rails on one of his rants on this topic. And we could, but I'm not doing <laughs> that because I want to focus on this book review and there's so many pieces in it. So for, you're just going to have to hold out. Sorry, okay. buddy. Jonathan has become so much, so much more Zen um, at age 41. We can't rattle I'll, him anymore. Okay. <laughs> You'll fourth, get me next week. I'll get you. Oh, I'll definitely get you. Okay. Fourth step in here after the cue, after the craving, after the response comes the reward. And so if we want to increase a good habit, we need to make it satisfying. And if we want to decrease a bad habit, we need to make it unsatisfying. That's correct. Uh, and I'll jump in on this one. One, I'm the weakest at this point. This law is the one that I need the most work at, um, in my own personal opinion and, and sharing. Uh, it talks about use reinforcement. Give yourself an immediate reward when you complete your habit. This is both from a goal perspective, identity perspective. When you're doing well, don't be afraid to say, hey, pat yourself on the shoulder. I did a great job. And then get back at it. Um, using a habit tracker and this one, I think, is really important. Keep track of your habit streak. Don't break the chain. He speaks in his book about one missing one day, it's an accident. Missing more than one day in a row, that's becoming a bad habit. The longer you can keep the streak going, we hear a lot about how long it takes to build a habit. And there's research that states that, yeah, it's definitely a lot longer than seven days. And there's some genetic component on top of environment component that leads to this. Uh, Andrew Huberman talks about this on his podcast at length, really important from a science background. But if you can not break the chain, you have a better chance of that process leading to the number four spot being reward, which is that habit is now in place. Mm -hmm. A few things that jump out just as you were saying that number one, the classic question, everyone says, how long does it take to build a habit? You know, is it 21 days? Is it 66 days? Whatever. In this book, James says, none of that matters. It's the number of repetitions, right? Because 66 days doesn't matter if you only repeated it twice, right? Tell so, me more. What does that mean to you? Well, it means you, it basically needs to be a daily effort. And then even some habits can be within the day. Like if we were to look at a mindfulness practice, you know, stopping and taking a few deep breaths, you know, you can program that into your life hourly you know you could you could like habit stack it like or cue it to like when i walk through the treatment room door right i'm going to like inhale as i walk through and then exhale as i pat like you know right so yep. that can be a habit and that habit could happen 50 times a day so that's where saying it takes 21 days or 66 days that that doesn't really compute because it's how many times are you going to do it until you lock it in on autopilot right Hang on. Yeah. The other thing that jumped out there to what you said uh, that he talks about in the book on never missing twice, every behavior you do is casting a vote for the type of person you want to be. And so when he talked about never missing twice, we, we also have to be gentle on ourselves because things are going to happen. But he, he suggests something really clever in there. I don't, we keep going on the workout one. So we'll stick with that. Let's just pretend you, you've, you've got it in your schedule that you're going to work out today. You're going to go to the gym. Something has come up and you're probably not going to make it. Go to your basement and do 10 push-ups, 10 jumping jacks, 10 sit-ups. Yes, you didn't get the full hour workout in, but you've casted a vote to yourself that you're the type of person that doesn't miss. Even though you modified, you didn't miss. Right. And I think that's really important because the people that lock in find a way, you know, to keep that rolling. Because one day of missing turns into two, turns into three, turns into I'll start next week. But you know what? We're halfway through the month. So I'll start next month, actually. But we're pretty close to the end of the year. So I'll just start on January 1st. Right. That's how that's how humans work. Excellent. Now, I think you 
are better at this reward and this fourth law compared to me. You and Rosalie, I think, have some examples, and I'm putting you on the spot here, where, again, you mentioned it today. You refinance. This has been a huge process. You're now going to go and celebrate. Has that been a, a, is that something that's innate in you? Has that been shared through life on the farm? Tell us about it, because you're good at it, I think. Well, thanks. I would almost argue I'm not good at it. I don't, um, I don't know, like, I don't know where it comes from, but I do, I love the process. Like, honestly, when I growing up playing hockey in a strange way, I almost like practice more than the game. My kickbox is exactly the same. You know, the practice was the blast. You know, yeah, it is like, and then patience is a huge one. You know, understanding that all these things are going to, going to take time. Um, from his book, I recently implemented, he, he has a paperclip example where I think it was a banker who every phone call would move a paperclip. If you're watching, I just implemented like a little, I got these jars and these beads in them. And so the glass beads are like my key tasks that move my business forward. And so when I come down in the morning, I already have them sitting right by my computer and I have to do that task. And when I do, I drop it in the other glass and it makes that little, the little ting sound. And it's like, it's like there, like I did it. Now the key is those have to be habits that actually matter, right? It's very easy to pick a habit that doesn't matter, that doesn't move the needle. And, and then you're just sort of spinning your tires. It's kind of like reading a book is good, but implementing what it says is what you should do which really for us on this podcast is exactly what we're doing. We talked about this late last year and said, Mike, have you heard of Atomic Habits? Yeah, I, you know, just was looking at it the other day. Dude, we got to reread this. You'd read it before. I had read it before. I'd forgot most of what I had read. So we said, we're going to do this. And then we stuck to it. And really, guys, we're helping you out. But I'm hoping in essence as well, we're helping ourselves. And I think we're going to. Oh, that's the funny part about these podcasts, man, is by re-reading the book, re-listening to it, imp- implementing some of the stuff. It's like, I get way more out of it. And then we just happen to like share what we learned. So that's excellent that everyone else gets to hear it and get value, but it is the preparation for it is, is where the needle moves for me. Yeah, I agree with you completely. So okay. uh, we're wrapping up here. I am going to, as we wrap up, I'm going to make you play a fun guessing game around the reward because. Rosalie and I are going on one of our, we're recording this on a Friday. We're going on a Friday afternoon date. We're trying to make this a habit to block in date time while Riley is at daycare so we can be alone. And we're going and we're doing something. Kudos to Rosalie because she booked this that I've always wanted to do, but I've never, ever done once in my life. So I'll give you one guess at what it is, and then I'll tell you what, it, what the reward is. Oh, I have to stay G-rated. <laughs> You're, it is G-rated. Yeah, it is. <laughs> oh, I don't know if I could do that. Oh, oh shit, Mike. Come on. Our guests are hanging. In the city of Saskatoon? Oh, yeah. Just fire subs it off. Everyone's like, come on, tell me. Does it have to do with food? No. I'm just going to tell you since you're not guessing. We're, I'm going and getting a pedicure. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, I am pumped, man. I am pumped. <laughs> I've heard good things about them. Not that I've done one myself. Yeah. Uh, good on you. Get those Saskatchewan feet looked after. They're cracked up old things. They are. I'm Part of me is slightly embarrassed, and I, I should just apologize in advance. I don't know who I'm seeing. Um, but, yeah, that's the reward. And I, I got to tell you, man, I'm looking forward to it. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing how it goes. And do they put a like a, a cloth on your face and chill you out with champagne on the side? How I have no work? idea. I've never been. This is uncharted territory for me. Look at my ignorance right now. Man, I'm looking forward to hearing how that goes. And uh, yeah, well, you know, there's there's a reward for today. That's the thanks. G-rated version. I like it. Stick right on. A couple other. Yep. Okay, thanks everyone. Thanks for putting up with me and Jonathan today. Atomic Habits, James Clear. Check it out. Jonathan, I never even told you this. Surprise number two. Uh, I am going to do, or we are going to do a book giveaway around it somewhere on Instagram. I'll figure that out, but we'll be giving away five copies of Atomic Habits. This one is in my top five. I have an unofficial list of books that are best all time. You have to read this. Go check it out. 
Have a great week, everyone. Thank you for listening to the Veterinary Project Podcast. As a recap, on behalf of our hosts, the Veterinary Project Podcast will be releasing new episodes weekly. So be sure to tune in as we bring you more conversations aimed at helping you enjoy a life well lived. If you enjoyed what you heard on the show and you want to stay in the know, please like, love, and or subscribe to the podcast on the listening platform of your choosing, as we're available on all the usual suspects. If you know of others that may benefit from these conversations, we'd love it if you please share the show with them, as this will help us grow our community to reach more and more veterinary professionals. Speaking of which, if you are a veterinary professional and would like to get connected with more like-minded individuals who are joining us on this journey, please send an email to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com, and we'll invite you to be a part of our private Facebook group. General feedback, requests for information, or perhaps requests to be a guest on the show can also be sent to the Veterinary Project Podcast at gmail.com. Dr. Michael Bug and Dr. Jonathan Light, thank you for listening to the show, and we'll catch you again next week for another episode of the Veterinary Project Podcast. Bye for now. Bye for now.